Good evening, everyone. Um, from the bistro, it's uh, it's kind of nice to uh, have everyone here. This is the most people we've had in uh, in the bistro, I guess, if you're virtually here um, since uh, before March 13th. So it's great to see so many smiling faces. Um, wanted just to uh, give everyone a quick heads up. We have uh, 12 states, three commonwealths, and two countries joining us um, today. Um, and so that uh, really tells you the type of reach um, that we have. And it's all for a great cause, it's for bourbon. A little bit of history about uh, Wyoming Whiskey and why we decided to uh, do this partnership with them. Um, at the Bistro, you know, with over 250 unique labels of whiskey on our back shelf, um, and Annie is, my wife is putting down our son right now for the next couple minutes. So she didn't hear me say that, but when she jumps in, if everyone can just be on the same page, if we don't have more than 180, that would be great. Cause that's where I told her we would stop at. Um, so, but uh, we're well past that 180 mark now of unique labels. And um, we were looking at different things of how to make sure that we are offering our, our guests the, the best possible experience. And um, the Wyoming whiskey kept coming up and kept coming up and kept coming up. And then a good friend of the bistros from Missouri had it at his, his home bar on one of his trips up, brought a sample into us. We're like, we have to find a way to get this. So working with uh, some of our partners, got connected to David DeFazio, had a conference call. Uh, David and I had a conversation about the similarities between Wyoming and Maine, um, the love of the outdoors, uh, the our mutual respect for for uh, harvesting um, wildlife and the responsibilities that go along with that, and also our passion for bourbon. And it seemed like a great fit for this private stock pick, um, and furthermore for bringing the brand into the state of Maine, um, where we think it's going to have. Uh, a great, great success here um, in Maine. Quick history. My name is David DeFazio. I'm one of the co-founders of Wyoming Whiskey. Uh, back in uh, the year 2006, well before the craft spirits movement was afoot, Brad and Kate Mead called me over to their office. And let me back up by saying uh, I'm an attorney. I had been working in their law firm for a few years, had gone on my own. And then uh, in 06, they called me and said, David, we've got a proposal for you. Why don't you come over to our office? So I went over to their office and it's this old creaky building in downtown Jackson and there aren't many old buildings here. It's, we don't have the history that the East does, but it was probably built around 1911. I walk in and it's creaky and I'm in Brad's office and it's wood floor and he's sitting at his desk and he's not saying anything. Kate comes in behind me and closes the door and they're both looking at me and my Catholic guilt just starts taking over. And I'm like, what did I do this time? You know, What have I done to screw up? And Brad said, Kate and I have decided we wanna make bourbon. And it broke the tension in my head and I laughed right in his face and he didn't laugh. So I turned to Kate and Kate didn't laugh. And I said, oh, you guys are serious. He goes, yeah. And I said, well, how the hell do you make bourbon? And he goes, that's for you to figure out. And that's how this thing got started. So none of us were experts in the field. Uh, I drank a lot of Jack and Cokes, much to the dismay of my father during college. And that was about my history with whiskey up and until he introduced me to Elijah Craig. That was the very first fine bourbon that I ever had. And it really opened my mind to the fact that you can actually sip on whiskey, in, in this instance, bourbon, and not shoot it. So really all my cre the credit for enjoying a bourbon goes out to my dad. Um, so we got working on this. And the first question is, well, what do you do? I mean, there's no roadmap for craft distilling back in 06. So we did what came natural. And that was we went to the Kentucky Bourbon Festival. And we had a fantastic time down there through some connections we knew here in Jackson. Uh, we were able to meet with Max Shapira from Heaven Hill. Uh, he said, don't do it. It's gonna cost three times as much, take three times as long and be three times as hard. And Brad and I took that as he thought we were a threat. So we were determined to do it. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, he was 100% right. It has taken a lot longer it has been way more expensive and more difficult than we ever would have imagined, especially on the distribution front, um, which back to the point of having Edrington involved has been a tremendous um, assist with us and we couldn't do this without them. So 
One thing led to another, and we ordered a still from Vendome Copper and Brass, which is the preeminent still maker in the country. They're located in Louisville. And I, uh, once that got underway, I talked to Rob Sherman and I said, hey man, you've got to find us a distiller. And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, I'm not going to run the still. Brad and Kate aren't going to run the still. No one will drink it if we make it. So he said, all right, let me, let me think about this. So about a month later, we get a call from him and, or I get a call and he said, I found your distiller. I'm like, well, who do you got? He goes, his name's Steve Nally. He's been with Maker's Mark for 33 years. He retired two years ago and he's ready to get back in the game. And I couldn't believe it uh, because Maker's had always been the one bourbon that Brad and I had always shared for barbecues and birthdays and special events. So it was uh, really a, a, it was fortuitous that he was available because Maker's had always been our go-to. And we wanted to do a weeded bourbon, which is somewhat unique in the whiskey world. I'm gonna enjoy some of this Manhattan. I invite you all to do the same. Hey so, David, so, just to jump in, we have a quick question. Sure. Is it pot still or column? It is a column still. So I'll, I'll expound upon that. We wanted to design our uh, distillery much like the like in Kentucky, what folks do down there at the big distilleries. And we basically took that roadmap or that template and we downsized it and put it into a much smaller setting here in Wyoming. So we have an 18 inch wide, 38 foot tall column still followed by a 42 inch doubler, which would be a pot, so to speak, a modified pot still. And that's exactly what Steve was using in Kentucky at Makers, but they use double 36 inch stills just to give you an idea of the size difference of our two distilleries. I like to say that, you know, the size of distilleries, if you go from one to 10, one being the absolute smallest distillery in the country to 10 being a Jack Daniels, we would be like a three and there's really nothing between us and Jack. I mean, those big distilleries are just so much bigger than us. And we're one of the largest of the small distilleries to put it all into perspective. So Steve came out, uh, he put the finishing touches to the design of our, the footprint and the layout of all the equipment in our distillery. And we got to producing on July 4th of 2009 with the goal to make America's next great bourbon. And then it was just a waiting game. You know, it was years of laying down product, hemorrhaging cash, uh, until we uh, drank enough of the Kool-Aid to make our first big mistake uh, of our young corporate history. And that was, we released a three-year, three-month-old bourbon on December 1st, 2012. Uh, to, it was the largest release in Wyoming's history. We sold 3,000 cases through the Wyoming Liquor Division in 26 seconds. Uh, it, it melted their system down. Uh, it was a huge day for us. We had invited 800 people to the little town of Kirby. Uh, excuse me, we invited 1,200 people to the little town of Kirby, expecting 800 to show up, and 4,000 showed up. Uh, people came from all around the country. The farthest traveled were some folks from Australia, and it was a real feel-good day. Uh, and then, unfortunately, the quality of our product was not up to the hype. And that's the biggest mistake we've made in our corporate history, and I'll take 85% of the blame. Um, you know, when you're drinking whiskey, when it comes off the still and it's clear, and then you drink it at one year and two years, you see the improvement, you're like, oh, it's so good now. Uh, but you're not comparing it to other things. And unfortunately, people were telling us what we wanted to hear. So we released it too young. Uh, luckily, it was only here in Wyoming. So we were able to limit that damage. Uh, but it was embarrassing. Uh, but we did go out, we sent a dozen salespeople around the state to buy back these early bottles and replace it with four-year-old, which made a big difference. And we have earned the respect of the state since then. So once we got that behind us, we started spreading out across the country with our small batch product, which is the flagship, which I'll get into in a second here. And uh, we worked with a number of different distributors over the years, finding great difficulty in gaining any real traction with them. Because at the end of the day with distributors, uh, it's the bottom line. Are you making us money or not? And a small brand like us just simply doesn't have a chance to compete against larger brands with big, bigger budgets uh, and established names. Uh, so jumping forward again, two plus years ago now, uh, we partnered with Edrington. Uh, we had been courted by a number of different companies across the country and globally actually uh, to join their teams uh, and portfolios. Uh, we quickly did away with some of them. Some of them quickly did away with us. And then finally, uh, Edrington has struck a deal that we've been very happy with. So that gets us to present day. 
Um, we have a number of different products in our portfolio. And Bob, if I get a little long-winded here, you just cut me off. But we, um, are, we started with our small batch. And not long after that, uh, Steve and a woman that we brought in to help with our tasting named Nancy Fraley identified that some of these barrels were really starting to shine through and being particularly special. Uh, so our second product was single barrel, which is in a brown label. It's released at about this time of year every year. It represents the top 1% of everything that we sell or excuse, that we find over the course of a summer harvest season. And that has been a huge seller for us and I wish we had a lot more of it. And then what naturally progressed from that was this private stock program. And the private stock program and these samples that you have before you are, uh, it's a great way for us to connect with special accounts across the country. You know, an account like Novio's that's interested in bringing in something that's truly unique and excellent uh, gives us an opportunity to interact with the account. There are a lot of laws and rules surrounding what we can and cannot do with retailers, which is why this is so nice, an event like this. So we end up sending out four samples of barrels that we pick uh, for an account. That account then will sift through them, go through a tasting panel. Sometimes individuals make the selection uh, and then let us know which barrel they've selected. We then put that under a private label. Bob will show you a picture of the bottle here, I'm sure, before too long. And we put the name of the account, as you can see right there. I don't know if you, you, you can see it, but the name of the account, the proof, which is uh, usually barrel strength. And uh, that will be the only account that gets to taste that barrel. David, you wanna walk through small batch a little bit and then we'll do private stock? Sure thing. Yep. So as I mentioned before, small batch was our flagship product. And when Brad and I were talking to Steve about what we wanted our bourbon to look like, taste like, et cetera, we had said we wanted a weeded bourbon and we gave him some ideas from other products that uh, we had liked in the past, including makers. Obviously, Steve had been making makers for years. He rose from the ranks of a security guy in the warehouse all the way up to master distiller, and uh, he knew what he was doing. So he ended up, well, we tried eight different yeasts, which I don't know how many of you are familiar with the process, but yeast is an integral role in the shaping of the flavor profile of any spirit really, but in particular brown spirits. So he tried eight different yeasts that were either um, given to him by others in the industry or just sourced from White Labs up in Canada, which is the number one uh, producer of these different yeasts. There's over 200 yeasts you can use to produce alcohol. And um, one of these folks that played a very pivotal role in the creation of our whiskey in addition to Steve was Lincoln Henderson. Uh, Lincoln Henderson had, was the kind of the face of Woodford Reserve and then later Angel's Envy. He started that brand and Lincoln has since passed, unfortunately, but he was one of the ones who suggested one of the two yeasts that we landed on to make our product. So we use one very high yield yeast uh, that's readily available to everybody, um, almost all distillers. And then we used actually a white wine vintners yeast in conjunction with each other to produce what you're tasting here. Uh, the white wine vintners yeast adds a bit of sweetness to it, uh, or I, not, maybe that's not, or fruitiness is probably the better word, uh, which rounds it out. And so that, in conjunction with a base mash bill of 68% corn, 20% wheat, and 12% malted barley, uh, brings to you what you are tasting in your glass today. Now, Lincoln once said that a flavor profile of a bourbon is broken up in a pie chart 10% is ingredients, 30% is yeast, and 60% is the maturation process. And while our yeasts are somewhat unique in how we use them and we actually pitch them together into fermentation, um, what's really unique about our product is the fact that we're aging at 4,000 feet in the Bighorn Basin next to a river in the sage grasses that occupy this high plain. And it's unlike any place in the world as far as we know I don't like to be the one to claim a superlative, but I do believe that this, these barrels are aged in the most extreme weather environment you, you'll ever find. And I say that because in the summer months, temperatures in the top of the warehouse can get as high as 126 degrees. And in the winter time, uh, it'll drop to as low as five. Uh, 